Okay, everyone, yeah, come on in and take a seat. It's, it would take eight and a half hours to fly to New York yeah. from Paris. Probably another eight and a half to get to the airport yes. today. <laughs> That's to say it's a, it's a long, long way for us to be able to go to the Met, but not only are you bringing the Met to us, but you're going to tell us about how APIs are bringing Absolutely. the Met to everyone. So Maria, welcome. Uh, yes, hello, thank you. So um, my name is Maria, and I do work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And I'm very honored to be here. Oh, I need a clicker. I don't know where it went. I have notes. This is to make sure that I don't forget anything. Thank you. So I'm, I have to tell you, I'm honored to be here, but I'm also honored to be in Paris because it's in Paris that the idea, the vision for the Metropolitan Museum of Art began. About 150 years ago, some businessmen, financiers, artists, and great thinkers of the day had lunch in Paris and they devised the idea to create a museum for art and art education for the people of America. They went back to New York, probably took them a lot longer than a few hours, and established the Metropolitan Museum of Art just a few years later. But it's their vision to collect, study, conserve, and present significant works of art across all time and all cultures to connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas that brings me here today to talk about our API. First, I do want to tell you a little bit about our collection. We have an encyclopedic collection. That means we have artworks that span all time and all cultures from over 5,000 years. Depicted in our collection, we have classical mythology, Buddhist deities, animals, satire, flowers, historical events, and human figures. We have over 1.5 million art objects, but only 4% are on view to the 7 million visitors that come to the Met on an annual basis. We have over half a million images online, but they're available to our 30 million visitors that come to our website annually. So if we're to fulfill our mission to connect people to ideas, creativity, and knowledge, if we're to be a museum of the world, about the world, and for the world, we have to connect to the 4.3 billion internet-connected people on the planet. The best way for the Met to do that is through partnerships and programs. And that's where our API and our open access program come into play. In February 2017, we launched our open access program, releasing all of our public domain images on creative, under a Creative Commons Zero license. It was a milestone in our digital partnership program, but you still needed to come to our website to download the images, or you had to use a clunky CSV file to download the images and data. Last October, about 18 months later, we launched our Met Collection API. This was the foundational step forward in our digital program, because it was how we made the museum's collection the most accessible, discoverable, and useful on the internet. The Met Collection API is where makers, creators, researchers, and dreamers connect to the most up-to-date data and images, to the artworks in the Met Collection representing thousands of years of human humanity. The API is central to our digital program because it's the way we can score, we can 
we can scale our partnerships, which is a core component of the Met's digital program. We view the API as a pipeline to partnerships and new audiences. We also want to encourage creators and other institutions to create and devise new ways to connect art to people. Here's some of our API data. The Met Collection API has over 406,000 images from 205,000 distinct artworks. Many of our artworks have several images. They're all under CC0 license, and they're all available online without restriction. Additionally, we made all of our digitized data available under CC0 license, which is about 470,000 data files of both our public domain works as well as our copyrighted artworks. And just last February, we added a subject keyword database, which provides over 200,000 subject keywords of our artworks. Our API data is updated on a daily basis. And in the past few years, we've added over 18,000 art objects on an annual basis, and they're updated on our API and part of our open access program. The benefits of launching our API were immediate. Our long-term partner, Google, via Google Arts and, Par Arts and Culture, was part of our API integration because they implemented the first implementation of our API. We had worked with them on various projects for over seven years and had only uploaded about 750 images. When we went live with our API, we instantly had access or they instantly had access to over 200,000 works to the Google Arts and Culture audience. By having our open access collection on Google Arts and Culture, the projects that we worked on that took days now took hours to put together. We now have our collection with other collections on their platform, and we can contribute to them at scale and we also get referral traffic. When we launched our API, we didn't quite have our subject keyword data set ready. We needed to test it a little bit more, but that opportunity soon came. Microsoft approached us with an opportunity to experiment with artificial intelligence, to explore what AI could do with our existing data sets as well as new subject keywords. We used this opportunity to also collaborate with MIT. We collaborated with MIT's Open Learning and Knowledge Future Groups, because why not add a few academic great thinkers, thinkers to keep us honest? The goal of the collaboration was to use AI, our API, and this new subject keyword data set to explore new ways to connect people to art globally. In a two-day hackathon, and then a few more weeks of prototype work, we held an event at the Met to share our five new prototypes that are connections to art. So to my right, to your left, there are a few slides here of our Gen Studio prototype. The Gen Studio prototype was a generative adversarial network that started with two works of art from different times and different geographies. And it let computers interpolate and generate works of art that could have been. It built the art in between using common attributes. The picture on the left was our storytelling app that generated artworks to help illustrate your personal story in one of 10 languages. On this side, at the top, you'll see My Met Stories application that connected your Instagram pictures to a related work of art. And then we had the Met Artwork of the Day program, which drew on historical open access data and combined it with a data connection to an artwork. On the left are pictures of a wiki art depiction game.
As part of this collaboration, we invited a Wikipedian who created a, de a depiction game that utilized the strength of the wiki community to validate subject keywords and to properly identify and make the works more searchable. This collaboration was a huge success. It showed us the range of projects that were now accessible with an API. And this was just the beginning. Not long after we concluded our collaboration with Microsoft and MIT, a new team at Microsoft approached us. They wanted to work with us on a new search proof of concept, which is called Art Explorer. Using our API and both cognitive and visual search capabilities, a user can start at the picture of George Washington crossing the Delaware and find their way to a sculpture of Minnehaha by an acclaimed sculptor of both African American and Native American descent, Mary Edmonia Lewis. This proof of concept also spawned a Bing visual skill which is now available to any developer to access and use today. Another example of a great partnership that has been enhanced by our API is Pinterest. We've been working with Pinterest for a number of years, but with our API, we were able to upload about 2,000 images in one batch. We still have a few more batches to go, but to curate the batches of 100 takes minutes versus uploading five images at a time. Pinterest's creative community has responded incredibly well to our initial upload. We saw immediate increase in traffic to our pins. We have great referral traffic. And in fact, Pinterest is one of our top referrers. This also supports our mission to connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas. We also engage with academic pursuits, such as our, we, ac we engage with academic pursuits because it, it enables us to provide art education. And I do have to tell you that in the past few years, this has radically changed. It's different, big data and technology are very different from the traditional art history classes that we used to be involved in. But it's really great to see. Here you see two examples from a collaboration with Parsons School of Design. They used it, our API for digital, uh, excuse me, for data visualization studies. We just re reviewed their midterm exams and here you see a landscape generator as well as an arms and armor presentation showing two very different presentations from our collection. We're also assisting a University of Virginia data science team using our API and machine learning in assessing bias in AI models. We're also, assist we're also assisting with a professional data science competition called Kaggle. Kaggle is progressing work and improving relevance of outcomes with fine grain attributes. We're happy to assist with these scholarly pursuits because it tells us something about the insights they have into our collection, as well as it raises issues with some of our data that we need to solve. For instance, we know that we have a long tail with our subject keyword data set. We know that some portions of our data is great for a training set, whereas others truly is not. We only have 600 cats in our collection. We also know that we have some data that will never be available. In antiquities, we will never know who the artist is. Clio is another example of a company that we were really unfamiliar with um, but they accessed our API as soon as it was available. Representatives from Clio contacted us and asked for a way to pull just the information from our Egyptian curatorial department. At the launch of the API, we didn't have that available yet, but we listened to them because we thought, well, if they need it, someone else might need it too. Now, as you can see, we're one of four museums 
that Clio uses to aggregate information that creates a one-stop shop for researchers across all of these collections. Creative Commons also integrated our API into their image search, and we have a few more integrations underway. I reviewed just a few of the projects that we're connected to. In the past several months, we've, had, we've been involved in some really fun and interesting and useful uses of our API. We hope there are more out there or that some are in the works. Just to review our API, it's on GitHub at metmuseumgithub.io. For the first version of our API, Google Arts and Culture helped us establish our API schema, the minimal viable product. Our partnerships since then ha have helped us launch further, and they've guided us into making updates and adding filters based on their own needs. Opening our API to the public has also been a healthy resource for feedback, and certainly Clio was an example of that. Today, we have endpoints for objects and departments and filters by artist, medium, date, geography, and more. We have a backlog of further enhancements. We plan to add filters for female artists and Wikidata IDs, all of which will help us slice and sort the data to make it even more accessible, discoverable, and useful. We could not have imagined all the things that would be the many ways that our open access collection would be used for. But we certainly knew that the API would provide the launch pad for these exciting projects. Again, I'm honored to be here in the city where the vision for the Met began. And perhaps the ideas shared here will lead us to new connections to knowledge, creativity, and ideas for centuries to come. Thank you. Fascinating stuff. Thank you, Maria. Sorry for my notes. Questions? from the audience. There we are, we've got a couple on that side. Okay, uh, first, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a two-part question. First, um, how can you inspire other museums to join the initiative to present their collection that way? And second, you talked about Pinterest and uh, Instagram. How did uh, audiences that uh, usually do not go to museum respond to that? I'll take the first one. So, and then I'll try to answer the second one. You might have to repeat it for me, so we'll see. Um, we, are, we were not the first to have an open access collection. Um, certainly the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam was. There are other notable collections out there. We certainly hope by putting, we are one of the larger databases of open access images and data, but certainly by putting our information out there, we hope that others will follow. We are also doing a lot of experiments with Wikidata, the Wikimedia Foundation as well, to provide a crosswalk of information so that these databases can be accessible for machine learning. We hope that these examples will lead, will be a leading example for other institutions. We just, we like to publicize them at events like this. Um, you had a question about Instagram and Pinterest as well, and part of, part of what we hope to do is that by being, we, someone else said it today, we need to be where audiences are. So if we only have 7 million visitors to our museum, and we have 30 million visitors to our website on an annual basis, if we are going to reach those 4.3 billion internet connected people across the planet, we have to do that where they are. We have to be on the other platforms. To be on Google Arts and Culture is a good thing. To be on Pinterest is a good thing. They have bigger audiences than we can imagine. Hello, again, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, 
uh, audio and video content. Uh, you've shown us that uh, all your uh, data are uh, oriented uh, to objects. Uh, do you think that you will uh, add uh, video and audio since people are more and more going to audio and video to learn about today uh, life as yesterday life? That's an interesting question, adding audio and video as well. Um, the, the difference is, is that the images and data are, are of works of art that are in, considered to be in the public domain. Audio and video aren't necessarily in the public domain. Now, we, there are discussions within the museum to make those available. We do make a lot of videos available on our YouTube channel. Um, we will have other channels that we're uh, discussing and hopefully launching on very soon. But we're trying to make our, all of our content accessible. Last question right there. Uh, thank you. I'm curious if the um, data being so accessible has led to academic innovation as well. I can see the technical innovation in this, but has it led to academic innovation as well? Well, I think that the example that we have of the Parsons uh, School of Design, the data visualization sets, has been fascinating. And again, the UVA, University of Virginia, forgive me, um, they're working with, you know, bias in AI models. Um, we're reaching out to as many academic institutions as possible. MIT has open learning. They have a, lot, a huge platform for op open learning. We are willing to put our content there as well. Open learning is absolutely part of our mission. Excellent. Maria, thank you very much.